Thank you for joining us. My name is Ian Borg, and I'm joined today with uh, Caleb Zarn. Uh, and welcome to Presenting for the Camera. Um, so we're going to go over our agenda for the day. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is Caleb and I are going to give a little bit of a background about ourselves. We're going to discuss why presenting for the camera is important. We're going to review an example that Caleb and I made and discuss that example, uh, at which point we will go over best practices. And uh, then uh, we'll tell you how you can do an individual assessment with us, or if you have any questions, how to contact us. So getting started, the first thing that we're going to talk about is who, who we are. Um, Caleb and I are part of the Academic Media Group. Uh, the Academic Media Group has been on the Lincoln Park campus since 1972. Um, and our role is to help faculty with the development of media. And that can take a wide variety of forms from uh, tutorials, how-to videos, virtual tours, case studies, uh, scenarios, interviews. And then we have a wide variety of tools to achieve that from traditional video, 360 VR uh, cameras, drones, uh, we can do animation, you name it, we can do it. Um, and we're a free service for faculty. So a little bit about myself, again, my name is Ian Borg. I'm the team lead of the Academic Media Group. Uh, I've been with Mount Royal for several years. Um, before that, I was, uh, I've worked at oil and gas, I've made commercials, I've made music videos, I've made a lot of broadcast sports, uh, NHL, um, CFL, all of the sports in North America. Um, I'm just going to turn this over to Caleb now. Hi there, I'm Caleb Zarn. I'm a uh, producer director with the Academic Media Group. And uh, prior to Mount Royal, I was uh, working in oil and gas in a uh, organization called CNOC International, and where I was a video producer there for about eight years, uh, creating all of their um, video content for everything from external marketing and branding material to their internal um, orientation videos, training videos, executive messages, all kinds, the full gamut. So, but anyway, I'm here at Mount Royal and excited to be uh, joining Ian in on this uh, course and taking you through what we've got. So uh, I think we might as well dive in. So our first point is called VSF. And, you know, so originally Caleb and I were, we were asked to come up with an intercession offering. Uh, and we, we had several ideas, and then COVID-19 happened. And like everyone else, the best of plans got thrown out, and we had to come up with a new idea. And we received an email from a faculty member, and it really inspired us to come up with this course for presenting for the camera. And I would just like to read this email to you now. Um, I wanted to share something with you. I've made up a new acronym, VSF. Video startle face. This is the face we make when starting to film our little video clips. It goes like this. Frown, as we try to remember what keys to push, then startled when we realize the recording has started, and then fake smile until we get to a happy place. BSF. Um, so other than providing a, a, a nice little chuckle, um, Caleb and I took this quite seriously, and we decided to come up with a few tips to help you um, present for the camera. Um, my next point here is making yourself look good uh, lets you stop worrying about your appearance and focus on what you're saying. Um, it removes distractions and allows your audience to also focus on what you're saying. It adds professionalism, credibility, and increases audience engagement. So uh, what we want to do now is take you through an example video that Ian and I uh, produced um, that kind of sh shows you what not to do. Uh, so while you're watching this, it's about a minute long, just be uh, thinking to yourself and observing some of the things that stand out to you as what could be improved. That could be anything from the lighting to the audio and, and everything in between. So. I'll just play that now and then we'll come back and we'll jot down a few of those points in this box here. So without further ado. Oh, hey, Caleb. How's it going? Hey, Ian. How's it going? I'm pretty good. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. You know, yeah. we shouldn't have that email flyer last week. 
Yeah. Man, it's just been so crazy since then. Things are picking up, hey? Oh, it's wild, dude. Um, So we got our class last week. Yeah. For about... Hmm. Sorry, I just took a big bite of my apple. We got our class last week for about 40 videos. 40 videos, really? 40 videos. Wow. And this is going to be a collaboration between social work and nursing. And they're going to use these for assessments for their students. They're going to use it as what? Testaments to their students? Assessments. Oh, okay. All right. So there's lots going on in there. So one of the first things I noticed when watching that video is, maybe it's because I was in the video, is uh, the, there was a very bright green Hawaiian shirt. Um, probably not the most professional shirt to wear in a meeting. Something else you might have noticed is I was chewing an apple and I was talking with my mouth open and chewing and uh, it, it really made for a lot of opportunities of miscommunication. Yeah. Another thing uh, I saw was there was lots of movement uh, with the cameras in the beginning, which is fairly distracting. Uh, Caleb was wrestling through his papers to find a place to start writing. So that created a lot of noise. Yeah. Um, and you were, you were in silhouette there. It was the bright window behind you is couldn't really see your face. And where the camera ended up, it was kind of looking up my nose. Yep. Yeah. And I think, yeah, there's some audio, there's some like music playing in the background, I think, in your scene there. Yeah, some distracting music playing in the background. Um, so these are just a few considerations. And Caleb and I are going to walk you through our examples and best practices. And we're going to revisit a few of these issues that came along in the recording. So our first best practice is finding a location. Now, when we're at Mount Royal, we don't really need to think about finding a location. We're in a professional office setting. Everywhere is a good location. But now we're doing something different. We're doing something quite intimate, in fact. We're inviting people into our homes. And they're going to come up with subconscious or conscious conclusions about who we are as people. Um, so we're going to want to think about finding a location. Um, so a good location has three main factors. It's quiet without any echo. A small to medium-sized room is best. It's bright with light on your face. And this could be achieved either by setting up near a window or using a lamp light to illuminate your face. Um, it's clean with a neutral background. No distracting items or mess. Uh, we remove any items that stand out, distracting art, messy furniture. Uh, we close doors to remove the, pet, uh, remove the chance of a family member walking by or a pet coming in. And we avoid bright windows or mirrors behind us. The next thing we're going to talk about is background replacement, chroma cam specifically. Now, what a background replacement does is it takes the image, it sees a view, and it does exactly what it says. It replaces the background. Um, this is a very handy tool, but it's not one that's recommended. It's, I, I think it's a little bit of a gimmick, to be honest. Um, if we look at the top left example of Caleb, he doesn't have a filter on. This is without the example. If we look at the top right, Caleb has added a blurred effect. And it might look all right, but I'm starting to see some clipping around the headphones. And this is even more prominent when we look at the bottom right with the, the brick wall added behind it. We see this cut off uh, looking shape, which can actually cause some more distractions than we would attend. Um, a useful application for this tool is for uh, disseminating information such as graphs or charts. We have this example on the bottom left of Caleb using uh, the, the chart function to show his numbers for a presentation. Um, something to keep in mind, now Caleb and I use the free version of this program. 
And using the free version has left a watermark on all of the photos here. It says chroma cam in reverse. Um, this is just something to keep in mind. We assume that the paid version that that watermark would be removed. Um, again, this is an option, but not one we would recommend. Now, if we look into our examples of finding a location, um, here we have on the top left uh, that shot from the example video of me eating my apple in front of the window. Uh, this isn't a good angle at all. And the big reason it's not a good angle, and we're going to touch on this a little bit further, um, is we're since we're using an automatic camera on our, on our phones or on our tablets, our laptops or our desktop computers, um, they automatically try to adjust for exposure. And what determines exposure for them is what the brightest object in the frame is. Uh, so since the window is behind me, that's what it's trying to expose for. Thus, I'm in silhouette and you can't see any expression on my face. And this is how humans communicate with each other is we look at each other's faces and we see expression. So we've, we've taken that away. Now, if we look at the, the green example on the top right, all I've done is I've moved 180 degrees. So now I'm facing the window and that light that was once a, uh, fighting the camera is now working for the camera. And you can see that my face is smiling. You can see the expression on my face. Now, if we look at Caleb on the bottom left, the first thing I always notice when I look at this photo is the boxes. And I, and I say to myself, why are there boxes there? I've created, you know, Caleb has created an opportunity here for me to not pay attention to what he's saying and start nitpicking what's going on in the background. And I'm going to start thinking, gee, maybe he just moved there. Maybe this is a storage room. Maybe this is just what his house looks like. I don't know. Um, but the big thing is we've, we've created that opportunity and we want to avoid uh, having our audience pay attention to our backgrounds because they aren't paying attention to what we have to say that. Now, if we look at Caleb on the bottom right, it's a whole new house from the looks of it. He's got a nice clean couch behind him. He's got a nice wall with a, a photo, a generic photo in the background. And, you know, it doesn't give me, the audience member, an opportunity to say, hey, what's going on here? And that's the big takeaway here is we want to give our audience uh, a chance to not ask these questions. Um, for example, with the image you see of me talking right now, my kitchen is behind me. And if I had a pile of dirty dishes in my sink, you might notice that. And you might start saying, gee, that Ian guy is really a slob. And that's not the perception that we want to give our audience members. So I clean my kitchen before we start the video. Because right? I want to give the perception, oh, there's no, no, distractings, no distractions here. Um, you know, I've closed the door in my house uh, so my pets can't walk in. Otherwise, you'd see a furry little face in front of the camera right now. Um, so these are all just things to keep in mind when you're finding a location. Great. So we're going to move on to talking uh, specifically about lighting. Um, and Ian touched on this. Uh, webcams and phone cameras uh, automatically adjust the brightness in the image for whatever is brightest. Um, so it's important to take just some time to think about how you're being lit. Um, and it's not just as easy as flipping the switch, of, you know, the light switch in the room you're in on. Um, you can get a little more uh, in depth here. Um, and so a few things to keep in mind is whenever possible, find a room with natural light and position yourself facing that window. And I'm telling you this as there's a window to my right. <laughs> um, so I just I just want to say that it's it's not always going to be this ideal situation. That's the recommendation, and it would be great if you can do it. Um, but just with room layouts and everything, it's not always going to happen. Um, and so what I've done to compensate is I've drawn the blinds over on this window to help kind of tone it down. Uh, but I've also introduced a lamp light uh, to my left here uh, to help illuminate my face. Um, and so the second point is uh, avoid having windows directly behind you. Um, 
so having it to the side is kind of like okay um but behind you is is more of a no-no because it will you'll then be running into that silhouette issue um, where you're uh, darkened uh, and can't really see you uh, the third point there if if natural light's not an option uh, if you're in a space without windows or it's nighttime or something you can uh, definitely use look look into using a lamp um, which is what I'm doing here, and I'll show you an, a picture of my current setup and how I'm getting this. Um, but with your lamp, position it to your left or to your right, and just kind of above your, your eye level there, um, and that will help avoid casting shadows down under your eyes, or if it's the lamp is too low, it would cast shadow up. Um, so kind of at that eye level, a little bit above, is, is ideal for controlling the shadows on your face. Um, and then the second thing you want to think about is softening the lamp light um, because if you just had a bare light bulb with no shade on it or anything uh, that's going to be pretty harsh light and it'll probably you'll be squinting it'll cast some hard hard shadows on your face so think about how you can soften it and ways you can do that is obviously put a lampshade on it um, if it's not a lampshade uh, type of light then you can uh, try another method called bouncing it, bouncing the light. Um, and you can do this where you're pointing the lamp at a piece of paper or pointing it at a, a neutral colored wall. Uh, and then the light will bounce back onto your face. And keep in mind that whatever color you're pointing the lamp at, like if it's red paper or a red wall, it's going to be reddish light that's hitting you. So the best rule of thumb there is just use white paper, a neutral, a light gray or a, a white wall uh, will do the best for, for that bounce uh, effect. Um, and then another option to consider for controlling your light is uh, in your lamp uh, would be getting a dimmer switch. And this is something that's like $15. You can get it at Home Depot and it just plugs into your wall and then into your lamp. And then you can use the dials uh, on there to uh, kind of fine tune the brightness on it. If it's too bright, you can kind of dial that back a bit. So here's this example again of, of, of me, but just thinking about the lighting here. Um, on the left, you can see that I'm squinting. There's a bunch of shadow under my eyes. Um, the light is so bright that yeah, I'm squinting and I've kind of created this kind of angry looking face. Um, so it's not not at all flattering. Um, and the light is bright. It's so bright that it's kind of washed out that my skin tone there as well. Um, and it's it's also blowing out or overexposing this wall. Uh, that's a, a kind of a whitish colored wall. So it's super bright. So it's too much. And I'm actually facing a window here, which is, you know, that's supposed to be a good thing, isn't it? Which it is, but it's it's too bright. So it uh, something like this could have almost worked if I would have drawn the shades that would have kind of cut down the brightness of that light and would have kind of softened it even further as well. Um, so what we want to do, though, is move over to this on the right in the green here, um, which is my current which is my current setup. And so I've drawn those shades, I've controlled that light that's coming in, that's quite bright, um, and I've introduced my lamp. So I'll just quickly show you what that lamp setup looks like. So it's one of these desk lamps um, that doesn't have a shade on it, so you can't just plop a shade over top. So in order to get around that, I'm using that bounce method that I was talking about. So it's the light is, uh, the harsh light is getting pointed towards that paper and then it's bouncing back a soft light um, and this effect again could be achieved with pointing a lamp towards a wall and then it bounces off the wall um, another thing to consider um, is and uh, this is just kind of an ideal situation is having a darker wall behind you um, that just helps absorb light and it won't it'll help uh, the background uh, be darker than you. So you'll kind of pop and stand out better in front of a darker background uh, like that. Uh, as you can see here again, this this white wall is is just way too bright. You don't you can't see anything there. It's just too blown out. So next we're going to talk about uh, camera position. Once you've found a great location with proper lighting and a neutral background, you'll need to position your camera. 
Um, here's some recommendations to keep in mind to get the best angle. Number one, position your camera at eye level. Ensure that's not tilted up or down, and the camera lens should be looking straight at you. The reason we want the camera eye level is because this is what we naturally do when we're in a face-to-face -face meeting or sitting down with others across a table. We're at eye level with them. And we're trying to replicate what we would normally do in a face-to-face -face meeting on the digital platform. Uh, the reason we ask that the camera not be tilted up or down is this is more to do with perspective. So if the camera is tilted up and looking at you, um, it's putting uh, whoever the subject of the camera up on pedestal. It's making them larger than life. Um, and the opposite is true if it's tilted down. We're, we're diminishing them. We're making them small. And we want to avoid this. We are looking for neutrality by maintaining uh, an eye level position. The next thing we want to do is we want to set up the camera about an arm's length away. So I'm just going to stick out my arm and we can see that I'm about an arm's length away from the camera. And this just nicely puts me in the frame. I'm not too close where I'm overpowering the image. I'm not too far away that I'm, it looks like I'm disengaged. Um, the next thing we want to do is center the camera on top of your screen so that you're framed in the middle and keep about a hand's width between the top of your head and the top of the frame. Uh, the hand's width is called headroom. And this just ensures that there isn't a great big space above our head or the opposite where we've started to cut off our head. Um, the reason we want to keep this camera centered on our screen, if we have a movable camera, some of you might be on a laptop where the, it's a fixed camera. Um, but the reason we want it in the center is when we show ourselves in the picture, um, we won't be in the center of the frame. Um, the reason for this is when you show a human being a frame, their eye naturally looks towards the center. So when we're in the center, they're naturally just going to look at us, which keeps us engaged. Now, if we look at the examples, now on the example on the left, that camera is low and tilted up to me. But as I said, what usually happens is we're putting them on, putting in this situation, that person up on a pedestal. That's not the case though because I'm so close and my head's cut off and it's looking up at me, you're getting a great shot up my nose, which is not really ideal for, for presenting. Um, the camera's a little bit too low because it's cutting me off just above my eyes. So, you know, if my head starts bobbing, it can start going in and out of the frame. Um, and yeah, part of my head's cut off. It's just, it's not a very flattering shot overall. Now, if we look at the example in the green on the right, oh, that camera's eye level. We can't see up my nose anymore. Uh, the camera is about arm's length away, and there's a good space between the top of my head and the top of the frame, where it's not an overpowering space, but nor is it cutting off my head. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about what's in the parentheses, of the laptops on the books. So as we can see in the photo, that's a short desk that I'm working on. And if I had the laptop just sitting on the desk, it would, it would probably be very close to what we have on the left with it looking at my nose. So how we avoided doing this is the first thing I did is I grabbed a Trivial Pursuit, which was about four inches high. And I put that on the very bottom. I finally got some use out of that board game. And then I visited my little library collection. I pulled out some of the thicker books that I own. I started making a big stack and I put my laptop on that. And the objective was to get the camera close as possible to eye level. I didn't quite get there, but it was a big improvement from what I would have originally had. The next thing we want to touch on is audio best practices. So good clear audio is as important, if not more important than good uh, video. Uh, if your audience can't hear you, you might as well just shut the whole thing down and um, it, it's just not going to work. So uh, Ian has a good uh, example from the Blair Witch Project, uh, the movie. So this is a movie that came out 20 years ago and it, it started a big movement um, in the film industry of handheld, shaky, found footage, somebody with a, with a, a handheld camera 
recording events as they transpire around them. And, you know, the reality is when we record with little handheld cameras, the audio is generally garbage. It's loud, it's distorted. There's the sound of the plastic moving in our hands as we shift the camera. And this isn't true to life. Um, and to, to go back to the movie, it, it's a movie. And you know there was a lot of thought put into the audio of that movie. And uh, to reiterate Caleb's point of good audio is more important than video. Um, if it was bad audio, we would all recognize it. We would hear it right away. Um, but we don't hear good audio. It's when good audio is around us, we don't think about it. It's, it's just good. It's, it's not distracting. It's pleasant. It's, it's just natural. So people will always recognize bad video, but they don't always recognize uh, good audio. Just something to think about. So uh, some tips for getting that good audio uh, on your, your webinars and lectures is uh, the first tip is around using a headset whenever possible. Um, and this will really help reduce echo. It will incre increase clarity um, and, and really will help avoid feedback. Um, and this is mostly because of how close um, the microphone is to your mouth. Um, it's really the equivalent of you know using speakerphone versus n not using speakerphone um, on a f on on your cell phone. Um, you know you can really tell when somebody's on speakerphone and when they're not. Um, so using a headset can really help enhance that clarity and and reduce the chances of any miscommunication there. And when it comes to wired versus wireless microphones, um, I would recommend uh, always looking to find wired ones. Um, where they're directly connected from the headset into your computer. And this really just helps avoid um, uh, issues like uh, battery in your wireless headset running out in the middle of a lecture. Um, and then you're scrambling to resolve that. Um, also, you can run into Bluetooth issues uh, between the headset and the computer, and then you're trying to troubleshoot that. Um, so using a wired headset really helps mitigate a lot of, of those things that can come up with a wireless one. Uh, the next tip there is just turn off uh, any distractions like the TV, the radio's on, turn it off, um, move away from other people, uh, close the door, um, and just kind of get yourself uh, uh, kind of tucked away in a quiet space uh, on your own. And then a note about pace and projection. So just about how you're speaking uh, with your microphone. Uh, you, you should be able to, if it's set up properly, you should just be able to speak normally, how you would in a face-to-face -face lecture um, or presentation. Um, you, you know, the microphone is, is pretty close to your mouth there, so you definitely don't need to be shouting or talking any more loudly than normal. Um, and, and just in your regular pace, um, if you're nervous, you'll tend to speak quicker. So just kind of be cognizant of that and just trying to, you know, relax, speak, speak normally, and you should be good to go. Um, if anything, maybe you could enunciate a bit more. Uh, sometimes, you know, bandwidth can cause little dips in the signal and you might lose something. Um, you might even need to repeat something you've said, but just keeping that in mind. And the last point there is about uh, muting participants to avoid distractions. So at the very beginning of your, your webinars, your lectures, just, you know, when you've got everyone's attention, some housekeeping uh, points is just ask everyone to mute themselves um, because it really only takes one person to have their microphone open and all of a sudden they're typing or their, you know, their dog is barking and it, all kinds of things could be happening. So just kind of set that expectation at the beginning of your presentations and you should be, uh, you should be able to avoid most of that. So now I'll just show you uh, the, the contrast between bad audio and good audio. Um, so we'll just play back this uh, needs improvement example first. 40 videos, really? 40 videos. Wow. And this is going to be a collaboration between social work and nursing. And they're going to use these for assessments for their students. 
they're going to use it as what testaments to their students assessments so yeah you you can see why this is the the bad version there's all the eating happening where neither of us are wearing headsets uh, you can hear some music in the background there. There's noisy paper. So there's lots of things going on there. Um, and so I'll just play back a version that's that's kind of the ideal, what, uh, what we could uh, be striving for. Um, we had a request uh, come in from Peter Choate, actually. Um, and he would like us to uh, film some assessments for his class. Oh, nice. So that's kind of like the ones we did, what was that, six months ago or so? Yeah, it's very much in the same vein as that. So there, it's uh, you, right away you can hear both of us much more clearly. Uh, we're both wearing headsets there. Um, and there's no distracting eating. There's no noisy paper. Um, the background is quiet. Uh, the music's been shut off. Uh, but the main, the main thing here is that there was no miscommunication. So all of these little little tips and things are, are building towards that goal where um, there's no miscommunication. We both know what each other is saying, and uh, and and yeah, we can just hear each other clearly. There's no feedback. We're good to go. And just before we move on, I just wanted to acknowledge that you know you might have noticed I'm not wearing a headset, and this is because uh, this is going to be something that Caleb and I are going to talk about a little bit later on testing your equipment. Um, when I was, I do usually have a headset but I was having issues where the audio quality was getting choppy. So sometimes we have to think of solutions to mitigate when we run into a problem like this. So I have a, a, a little microphone right here. And so to avoid feedback, I'm doing as Caleb suggested. When I'm not presenting or talking, I'm muting my microphone. And when we're, avoid, we're doing the best we can with what we have. And that's all that we can ask of anyone that attends this. I mean, this in a perfect world, we'd all have headsets that work flawlessly. Sometimes that's not the case. And when it's not the case, we have to come up with little solutions to, to avoid bigger problems. Uh, something that Caleb and I did is before we did the recording, um, we set we figured out what volume my speakers should be at so they wouldn't feed back. Um, when Caleb's talking, if I forget to mute, or that they're not so loud that my voice starts coming back and then creating a feedback loop. So just a little FYI. Yeah, that's great. Um, another point I wanted to mention just around headsets and, and why uh, this version, even though it's a bit clunky looking, um, it's 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 kind of ideal because the microphone is is rigid it's on this arm that's connected to the the speaker part um there's other headsets that are more subtle like earbud style ones but they have the microphone on the cable that's coming down um and and those can work great you just need to kind of have awareness of is that microphone rubbing against your shirt is it kind of hitting your chin that kind of thing so with this sort of microphone, again, it's it's rigid. It's not going to be bending and 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 rustling against clothing or anything like that. Um, and also, when I move my head, uh, my microphone goes with me. So if I'm turning or looking down or looking anywhere, uh, you're still going to hear me just the same. Um, and so that's something to consider when you're looking for headsets. So now we're going to move on to some other considerations uh, while presenting for the camera. And the first thing we're going to talk about is what to wear. Um, so we're all in a professional setting, so we should dress professionally. Um, that's the first takeaway. Um, the second, we want to think about how we're going to contrast with our background. For example, I'm wearing a gray shirt right now. And if I had found a background that was a solid gray that was a very similar color to my shirt, that might give a floating head effect. So we want to think about our backgrounds again, uh, just and how our clothing is going to contrast with that. And the second point there is just around eye contact. And so again, like the, a lot of what we're doing is we're trying to emulate uh, in-person conversation. And so when it's 
when you're in person, you're having eye contact. Um, and so the only real way that we can achieve that over webinars uh, uh, is by looking into the camera. Um, so it's a, it's a bit of a, a, a thing that takes some practice to get used to because it's a bit awkward looking into the unblinking eye of the lens. Um, but it really can increase that engagement um, when you're speaking to your audience. Um, and you maybe, you know, you can just try it when you want to emphasize some really key points or if you have a heartfelt thank you or something like that that you want to give. Um, so consider that, you know, using using the camera to to uh, engage your audience that way. Because if you think of newscasts or, you know, Justin Trudeau giving some kind of update, you've it, it's going to be he's looking directly in the lens. Uh, and that's because that's eye contact. That's the most engaging way that you could address your audience. And our next point is very much related to eye contact. Um, using your computer as a teleprompter or just for notes. Um, sometimes we need to be reading and still maintaining a level of eye contact. So what we can do is we can just have our notes right below uh, the camera or if we have text on screen or we need to say something prepared. And when we're reading, we just want to always be reading right below the camera lens and we could use our mouse to scroll the text. Uh, so if it's a longer document, uh, our eyes won't be going down, 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 and down, and down as we read, but rather we'll be more engaged with our audience by maintaining that eye contact. And our next point is on glare. Uh, and this is something that affects me because I wear glasses. So when I set up a light, I have to think, oh, is there going to be some glare in my glasses? Now, glare happens in real life, but sometimes it can be overpowering. Um, and the way we kind of avoid glare is we need to think about the angle of attack. And the best way to think of angle of attack is a pool game. So say we're playing pool and we need to bank our shot off the side so it goes into the pocket. So what we're going to do is we're going to look and go, okay, well, this is the angle that I need it to go off of the, the side of the pool table to go into the hole. So it's the exact same is true with light. So if I, for example, if I had a light right behind my lens, it would be pointing right into my glasses and bouncing right back into the lens. So a way to avoid that is I could put my light up high and then that's an angle. And then the bounce of light will be down instead of directly into the lens. And our next point there is uh, about camera awareness. So this is really just kind of a reminder <laughs> and, uh, and a way to avoid some embarrassing situations. Um, so whenever you're, you're presenting, you kind of always want to have, or even if you're just an attendee at a meeting, um, to have that awareness and that kind of that antenna up about, okay, my camera's on and my microphone is on, um, and then say something comes up that you need to uh, tend to, you know, because life happens, you know, kids are, are needing your attention or the dog's barking or whatever is happening, or you're just, you know, hungry, you got a burrito you need to eat. Um, just make sure that you're, you're aware that you could be a distraction to the others in the meeting. So just make sure to, uh, to mute your microphone and shut off your camera if you need to do any of that kind of stuff. And, you know, just, you know, let, if you're presenting, let the let the audience know what's going on. Sorry, I need to take a second and just mute everything that, you know, avoids all that uh, embarrassment that might happen if they were to see it or hear it. And our next point is around having in-class documentation prepared or emails ready to send, links already open, testing equipment. Um, we've all heard stories of going into a class and perhaps the professor or instructor wasn't quite ready at the beginning of the class. And the PowerPoint projector wasn't turned on yet. The computer wasn't on. Uh, the USB stick that the, has the presentation is still in the car. Um, all of these things that have created a distraction and a setback for the class time. Uh, it's just important to think about and, and being prepared 
and testing equipment beforehand. So that way you're ready to roll when it starts, which then leads us to our final point. So the final point is, is, is just about practice makes perfect. Um, and so this, the, all this kind of, you know, this presenting, this remote teaching and, and remote delivery is new. It's, uh, you know, it can be uncomfortable and it's just going to take some practice before you can get into that comfortable zone. Um, and so a nice way to practice and to kind of see how it's going and, and to get into it is to set up a test meeting for just yourself. And so that would be, it's just you, you have some of your content, maybe five minutes or, or even less, um, and you just record yourself uh, giving that part of your lecture or that part of your presentation. Um, and then you can stop the recording, you can review it and see, you know, how's the lighting in there? How's it, how am I coming across? How's the audio? Um, and then you can kind of fine tune it from there. And the, all of these tips that we've talked about are, they apply to synchronous or asynchronous uh, styles. So it's, you know, whether you're live or not, um, any of these tips are going to help you in those situations. Um, and then if you're, if you're having trouble, if you're, you know, trying to set up your, 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 your lights and everything and trying to figure your background out or anything like that, you can, it, it kind of brings us to our last slide here, which is um, some individual assessments are available. So Ian and I are happy to help. Um, you can book something with us. Um, and, and we can just kind of, you know, over, over uh, Google Meet, we can kind of assess your situation and, and help you out there. And again, yeah, just to echo Kate, what Caleb just had to say, if you have questions, please feel free to email him or myself, and we'll do our best to help you out and get you on the way uh, for success. Um, at this point, I just want to thank you for joining us today and taking the time to watch our presentation. Um, again, our emails are on the bottom of the screen. I can be contacted at iborg at mtroyal.ca. And Caleb can be reached at czarn at mtroyal.ca. And thank you for taking the time today.